Welcome to a very special edition of Turn a Page, the official comic book club for Nerd Initiative. My name is Ken M. You know me as the host of the ODPH podcast. I'm also Nerd Initiative Editor-in-Chief. Joining me for this very special occasion is Nerd Initiative's Managing Editor and Paperweight Entertainment's very own Derek. What's going on? Hey, Ken. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be on here. Uh, for those of you that know, don't know me, my name is Derek Hoskins. I am the Managing Editor for Nerd Initiative, also known as Paperweight Entertainment Online. I love comics. I love to talk to authors. Can't wait to do this. Absolutely. And we have a very special author joining us because not only is there a special book that is dropping via Marvel Comics on October 2nd, but he just finished wrapping up an amazing story of sex, blood, and rock and roll for Oni Press with Okogun, Brutalizer of Gods. So we definitely want to talk about the Brutalizer of Gods before we go into Mar Marvel's Mightiest Mutant and the Goddess herself, Aura Monroe. So we definitely have you all set to go to the comic shops and go pick up these issues when they drop. Please welcome to the show the one and only Mariwa Ayodeli. Maria, how yeah. are you doing? I'm doing good, doing good, doing good. You did really well with the pronunciation of my name. <laughs> Thank you. I was trying. I was just, I'm like, I'm so excited. I didn't want to just mess up the words as going because like I alluded to, you have two fantastic books one out right now, and the other is on the way, but I definitely want more people to get aware of Okugan, Brutalizer of Gods from Oni Press. So why don't we start off, just give a brief synopsis of what that story is all about. Um, Akugun Brutalizer of Gods is um, inspired by Yoruba mythology, a tribe of which I belong to, and um, it centers around the creation myth of the Yoruba mythology. And the, sh lo the shot of it is basically we were all made by a drunk god, mm. a god that's basically driven by chaos. And that's why our world is in chaos. So we're going to follow the story of a, a hunter warrior on how we navigate this crazy world made by this drunk god. And how at the end of everything, uh, he loses his family, he loses the things precious to him, but... At the center of it all, he's not only just this drunken god, but it's a war god, and he's going to face this war god in a battle to the death. So that's basically what this story is about. And it's crazy, it's brutal, there's 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 action, there's sex, there's everything you want in a barbarian story. Oh, absolutely. Like when you're looking for the total package, this story has it. And it literally locks you in from page one of issue one right to the shocking end of issue number three. But I don't want to get into that. But I know Derek is chomping at the bit to ask a question here. Yeah. Uh, so F sorry. F no, no, go ahead. Package. Go, go. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, Maria, you know how much I love uh, Akugan. Um, absolutely love this book. Uh, one of the mm -hmm. things that you warned me about before I started reading it, because I'd only really read your your Marvel work, is just how brutal this book really was, and it really is. This is a this is an adult story. Uh, with it being an indie book, were there any was there any pushback or anything from Oni Press telling you to pull back a little bit from that violence and sex, or were they saying just go and and do do your thing? Uh, that that's a very odd thing. When only press reached out to us, they were like, no bars old, you know, go all out, do everything you can imagine and stuff like that. And then the scripts come in, they're like, okay, good. I was, I, then I was wondering, is it that they didn't read the scripts? Okay, so I'm like, okay, good. And then the artwork came in and then they're like, wait, 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 hold up a minute. Hold up a minute. You didn't tell us you're going to do this. You didn't, and they start trying to, and I'm like, dude, you told us not to like hold back, you know? So, and the funny thing is we were still even controlling ourselves because Dotsu and I uh, uh, come from a religious background where his mother is a pastor, my dad is a pastor and they are still ministering. So technically, um, we're a little, sometimes it's sad that we don't have comic shops in Nigeria, but sometimes I'm also happy because no random church member might go to the comic shops to see the stuff we're working on. So... <laughs> But it's it's really funny because they were the ones telling us that go all out. And when we just started showing the tip of the iceberg, they're like, okay, 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 guys, you know, calm down, calm down. But <laughs> there was there, there were a lot of pushbacks, especially when it came to the sexual content. And one of the things that gave us confidence to stand our ground was um a creator named Brian Kevon, we know him from Saga. 
Mm-hmm. And um, he talked about he, he's, he's one of he's my favorite creator. So and he talked about he and his peers always have this argument of which anytime they try to do indie work, they claim to always push themselves. And they always push themselves only when it comes to violence. But when it comes to certain topics, especially when it comes to sex, nudity, and some certain topics, they tend to shy away from it. So, and he, he tries to push that envelope. And I'm like, okay, I if he can do it, I can do it. So Saga was, anytime we're having arguments with the publisher and our editor, Saga was always a book we brought up. So sometimes they're like, you know, Saga has like, you know, 50 issues under their belt before they could do stuff like this. I will just show them Saga issue two. This is issue mm-hmm. two. These are sex scenes. This is someone almost doing like doggy style in issue two. So please don't tell us this is too early. You know, so stuff like that. So there was a lot of pushback, but it was fun. And eventually they kind of understood and they started changing the ratings on the book. Yeah, that's amazing. And yeah, Saga definitely pushes the envelope. And this one really does too, because you're telling a very mature story, obviously dealing with a lot of different elements involved too, and a lot of great characters as well. I mean, Amaya was one that stuck out to me, and especially what goes down in issue number three. It Was there any character that really stuck out to you as like your favorite when you were writing? Or was there a moment that you're like, oh, this is like, you're just completely like, this is what I've been wanting to do. Like, this is my favorite moment. Um, Obatala was uh, the favorite god to write. Um, and the reason is because uh, when it comes to writing gods, the same preferences that Western cultures have is also the same preference we also have. Everybody loves the god that can shoot lightning and that can summon fire. So Shongo is the popular god that people like to put in their stories. A lot of the stories is about Shongo because Shongo is a very violent god. And in storytelling too, in superheroes, all those stuff, you love that show of physical strength it's easier to tell stories about gods like that. But when it comes to gods that have to do with wisdom and a god that is a a creationist god, a creator god, how do you tell a story about a creator god and make it fun and Mm. make it visually interesting? So it was really, really challenging. Like, okay, there's a fight between a creator god and a war god. The war god is also a god of metal. So, you know, that's Magneto. You get Mm. That's Magneto. You can you can do all that or Dr. Manhattan changing something to another material, you know, changing maybe like a box of metal stuff into a spear, you know. It's, you can create visually interesting stuff, but a creator god, how do you make it interesting? How do you create a fight scene with that? So that was the challenging part. And when I was now doing my research into the story and finding out that while he was drunk, he tried creating mankind. And he just kept creating these grotesque creatures that were too burnt or whatever. In this original story, it's claimed that oh, people that have um people that have disabilities or are born strangely is because Obatala was drunk when he created them. So, but I put a twist on it saying that you know, when he was drunk, he created monsters. So I'm like, okay, why don't we play with the fact that if he can create things, why does he create visually interesting things to defend him? And so just playing around with the fact that it's just this extremely wise God that can create whatever he wants, they will start playing around with the fact that he has laid down all these traps, all these monsters. And even the entire book of book one to three is just a fight scene between Obatala and the world and the world God. Because everything that happens is still his creation. Mm -hmm. All the scenes, all the human beings, everything he interacts with are things he had concocted in his mind. It's all his scheme. So getting to draft a story that is not about exchange of blows, but more about exchange of schemes, you know, the clashing of schemes was very, very interesting. And Obatala, because of his wisdom, always has very nice, intelligent dialogue that I love writing. He has very quotable quotes. So it was the, it was the most fun to write because it was just so different it's like imagine loki was like as powerful as odin or something or revered as odin you know how do you write that like he's not the scheming underdog he's he's the he's the super boss and he does that without magic to change things you know, it's just just about his intellect everything's our intellect so it's it was really fun to write 
Uh, that's amazing because yeah, the whole story is just it's visually layered and and of course structurally layered. Like there's so many different elements in just a barbarian going through and killing gods. Like this is just on a whole different level of just intensity with action and mixing with the sex and mixing with the drama too. Like this is was an experience to read and especially going into that final issue, which like I say I'm I'm trying to avoid spoilers of going into, but I know Derek and I both were saying after we read it, just like wait, it can't end like that. Like it just like well, we want more. Like wait, wait, what do you mean this last this last issue? Like there's just so much going on with it, and it's truly an impressive read. And that's why everybody really needs to go out and get these issues before it starts dropping via trade paperback in March, I believe, of 2025. Yeah, and uh, you know, to that to that point, we we were talking before you got on here about that ending, the 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 mic drop ending to issue three. Um, and so it's got us asking, you know, what's what's next? What's going on in that world? Uh, what can we expect, if anything, moving forward? And uh, and maybe, possibly, if you can tell us, maybe when we could find out because you got us, you got us chomping. Yes. I want to, I want to get back into that world. I loved, I loved that ending, but I want to get back <laughs> in the world. Okay. Um. The the ending also had a lot of pushback. We also had a lot of pushback with the mm -hmm. ending. Yeah. Um. Because hmm. um. We. Typical storytelling that we get is um even if it's going to be it to be continued, we would love something for oh it the resolution happens and then there's a ride into the sunset. Mm -hmm. You want to have that ride into the sunset, you know, with a cool narration saying, you know, finally I've had my days and this days, you know, so that there's this feeling of satisfaction at least. The story, so the story feels like it ends very abruptly for some readers. If you are used to that riding into the sunset thing. And it's a type of ending that, tech, to be honest, I used to hate them. But as I grew older, I, I gained respect for those type of endings. Because, uh, for example, Warren Ellis did those kind of endings a lot in his Moon Knight miniseries. Hmm. in his one shots where they are those endings are there for you to they're not there to give you satisfaction the satisfaction should be in your own imagination i wonder how this ends and another reason why i also love those endings is because while i was analyzing the difference between theater and folktale i saw the differences in how they end their stories the modern cinema, that's um, um, comic books, uh, movies, novels, all the stuff, I think they are born from theater. And that's basically uh, when a bunch of people go from village to village, town to town, city to city, and then they perform a little drama in some cultures, maybe like Asian cultures, it's like puppets, some it's like human beings and stuff like that. And they tell you these stories. And many times you pay for those stories. So you should give them satisfactory endings because they are paying for it. And then you leave that village, you leave that town, you go to the next one. But in folk tales, it's not told by a visitor, it's not told by someone that's girlfriend, it's told by the elders of that community. And those stories, if you notice them, it's across culture. They always end in ambiguous, vague, abrupt ways because they are there to spark conversation amongst the people, amongst the youth. You know, like, I wonder why he did that thing. What if this happened? Are you sure he even really died, you know? And then before you know it, after telling this story at maybe this festival, to the next festival, they still have discussions about that still, till they hear another story. So they are structured differently. And it's something I've been trying to play around with. Like, I understand the satisfaction the theater type of storytelling brings, but I want to start playing around more with the folk tale type of storytelling, especially when we are talking about fantasy. Because fantasy was born from folk tale storytelling, not from theater. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the thing I was playing around with. So I, I had to stand my ground when it comes to that kind of ending. So that's one. And um, so for, for having a, uh, a book two, 
um, we're waiting on Oni to be able to give us the green light. So I think they're still trying to do their mathematics and putting everything together about the sales of the floppies, sales of the trade paper bag, and see if it was profitable for them. Probably because Oni is also into Hollywood, probably try to see if they can shop it uh, to Hollywood and stuff like that. And then talk to us about a book too. And then we'll come back and do a book too. The book two is um, titled Akogun, Revenge of the Gods. So it's basically centering around the um, escalation of the battle of the battle between Oromila and Obatala, the two supreme deities. And now there's a new god of war. It's no longer Ogun, it's Shongo. And we know how brutal Shongo is. So mm. how will Akogun be able to face Shongo? A god that does not underestimate his enemies and is much, much brutal. So yeah. No, that's incredible. And I, I like I say, I hope it does get to me in the uh, feature film because it definitely fits that. And that is why especially everybody needs to go to the comic shops right now and go pick this series up before it comes out and trade paperback. And then you go buy another copy because you want to make sure you get the whole story together because this series really has something for everybody. We can't stress it enough. I know Derek and I go back and forth about how amazing this series is and everybody needs to check it out, especially as we're transitioning now into a, a new chapter as one is closing from uh, Mirwa, we now have the return of Marvel's Mightiest Mutant in October. From the ashes of the fall of Krakoa, we have Storm and her ongoing series. So let's talk about that. How did this all come about? Um, yeah, I, I just literally wrapped up work on... Um... Aqua Brutalizer of God, Dotun was still drawing it, but I finished scripting. You know, but sometimes pages will come and then you still change dialogue and stuff. But I was basically just still resting and um I was out with my girlfriend doing some shopping and um I just got an email titled Storm. <laughs> Sorry, so, I, I lost those, internet for a second there. I apologize. Go ahead. We're yeah, back. Right. And yeah, some of those decisions basically are she's not based in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Um, she's a member of the Avengers. She's going to be involved in international politics. And um he knows some creators don't like when you have the status quo determined for them. But with that, will I be able to like kick off the story? If I have any I any contradicting ideas, if they are strong enough, they are willing to compromise in some areas. Will I want to take over the job? So that's how I got the email. And um uh, I was excited, I was scared, and my I I called Dotun to tell him about it. I told my sister. And I was so scared that my plan was to tell them no, that I would not want to take on the project. And it's, the reason is, okay, we all know there have been numerous Storm series. Mm -hmm. None of them have been particularly great success. And I'm going to be the first African to write this character mm. and I felt there was going to be a lot of pressure to get to get it right and I and I was scared I was going to crack under the pressure to be the to be like the first person to get it right or something and I felt some of my decisions a lot of too much meaning would be read into them like for example in the solicitation for issue three, Storm is going to lose her powers for seven days. Even though there's still that, that um, seven days clause, I'm already getting some pushback for just a very select few, just a very, very few. I'm even surprised it's that few. That, oh yeah, I'm already, I'm taking the powers of a black woman, you know, that I should know better. You know, so I was really, really worried that People would expect me to know better and any decision I make will come with too much criticisms and 
a lot of character, a lot of better writers have tried to get Storm and they haven't. So a lot of weird things were coming with it, and I was so scared. It felt like I was facing an impossible battle. So I was like, man, I think it's better to say no and hope I get another project or something. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it it is it is a challenge to jump into the X universe. I I just go based off what I've read from Okogan, and I'm like this. I'm like this is gonna bring like such a different look to Storm's character, and just like you know the path going. Especially now, it's such a wide open playbook from the you know the X Men line just coming out of Krakoa, and everybody, it, you know, all the mutants are trying to find like where do they fit in now, especially after just you know like such a game changing moment that was going on with um, House of X and Powers of Ten. So just you know to hear that, I mean it, that's very interesting. So um so Dotsu now said um Dotsu gave me an advice. He said um they are pro that trust me, um Tom Rivers is not the type to like he doesn't believe me like maybe diversity hiring or oh this guy is my friend or this guy is anything. If you can't bring the goods, he's not going to offer it to you. He's, he, he doesn't play politics that way or anything. So he says, so if you say no to this project, it's probably good to give a writer not as good as you are. And every time you read every issue and you're like, I have a better idea than this. You're going to eat yourself every single month. Mm. And my sister was like, see, you just finished an indie book. You need the money from big two. So shut up your mouth, be a good Nigerian and take the job. <laughs> <laughs> that's great good advice, advice. that's yeah. great advice <laughs> you know uh, you, you you said you've mentioned it a couple of times now about oh better writers better writers have have done this or could have done this and i, I i'm going to push back on that maria you've become one of my favorite art or authors in in comic books the way that you and i'm not just blowing smoke because you're on here talking to us right now the way that mm -hmm. you can craft a story and the way that your mind works is is fantastic and you you seem to go to these lofty heights in your storytelling and what is storm if not one of the loftiest characters in the marvel universe so i i think that this is a, a fantastic pairing and i was going to ask you you know what your biggest challenge was but you've already answered that and and i think it's fantastic that you were able to pull past or push past your own uh concerns and your own uh feelings of inadequacy to to do this because i have to be honest storm has never been one of my favorite characters to read watch anything I'm really excited about this book specifically because you're the one that's writing it. So, I mean, I, I think it's fantastic that your, your sister gave you great advice to just shut up and do the work <laughs> and, uh, and that you were smart enough to listen because I'm really excited to see, to see what you do with this. Uh, yeah. When um, I started doing my research, reading uh, Storm comics and um, dropping pitches and very quickly I, I I got into the vibe. I, I got inspired. I started throwing pictures at uh, Tom Brevoort, you know, issue one, issue two, you know. At some point, I already had stories about a, a, a planet. I don't want to give out the name because I might still use the idea, but a living planet that is like probably like best friends with Ego, the living planet, but it has its own badass name and stuff like that, you know. And some people are like, dude, look, calm down. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> you're already starting like this major space opera in issue one. You know, let's we we are at uh, it didn't say this point black, but I get what we're saying. It was like Phoenix is already like the space opera book. Mm -hmm. Storm is on Earth. She's an Avenger. Yeah. Try to center it around Earth, you know, and stuff like that. So that kind of grounded me a little. And because um, I was also coming from Avengers, um, like, you know, Derek, um, Iron Man is like my all time favorite mm -hmm. character. I love Iron Man with all my heart. So I also was coming from the place where almost every issue had Iron Man in it. So <laughs> it was like, <laughs> dude, <laughs> dude, um, 
calm down, you know, calm down. Uh, she's an X character, you know. Why don't we use like X characters, you know, a, a little too much Iron Man here, you know, and stuff like that. So, and um, I think what how that helped me was um, I think it's there's this thing about uh, ten thousand hours and other stuff. So basically, I'd gotten out within a few weeks. I'd sent out like tons of pitches, like 10, 10 pitches, just sending different story ideas back to back, back to back, back to back. So that kind of cleared all the bad ideas. So, and all the lack of confidence, all the fear was also gone with all those bad ideas. So what was left was, okay, I have all these story elements. Some of those bad ideas had good bits there and I could start building and stuff so and now there were elements from what storm what tom brevoort told me that i could bring to it and number one thing is about the mutant metaphor and i think sometimes it's gotten skewed a little but the mutant metaphor is a little close it's not exactly but it's as close to every other superheroes inciting incidents what motivates them what grounds them to earth what makes them relatable to us. So it's basically their relationship with Earth. How they love Earth, but sometimes they don't feel like they belong. And playing with that metaphor as we tell this grand, epic, cosmic thriller story at the back of it. And... I've been fascinated by the cosmic beings, especially Oblivion. And I'm like, see, something about Storm, that a lot of Storm stories is, I think I when, when I was doing research, because I also listened to what fans say about characters and stuff like that. And one of the things that a fan said on one of these websites was that, you know, sometimes Storm has turned into this character where when there's this big bad guy, Everybody has had difficulty beating. Storm just comes up and wipes the floor with them. And that's basically the role she plays. And when it comes to characters like that, like Superman and stuff like that, the role people play is maybe um, they tend to become boring to tell engaging stories with them. And I think you don't have to like reduce their power sets to make that happen. You'd have to make them evil or break bad or some, something to make that interesting. All you just have to do is make the make the challenges way harder. Mm -hmm. Like the challenges that Martian Manhunter will face, you don't you, you don't give Superman. The challenges Superman has to face has to be way more than everybody. You know, you mm -hmm. see characters like Dark Side where every hero has to even team up. And then you give Superman to fight him solo. You're like, damn. You're like, damn. So, and that's what I thought for Storm. If she's the Omega of Omegas, which is basically coming from X-Men Red, how um, Al Ewing had set her up as the Omega of Omegas, nobody messes with her. Then let's not tell stories about Omega level threats. Let's tell stories about beyond Omega level threats. And what do we think? So we're not talking about characters like Thanos here. We're not talking about characters like Annihilus. We're talking about characters like Oblivion, Eternity, the big cosmic entities. How do you face them? And so that's kind of the kind of stories you want to tell here and see how we make it happen. So it's going to be, it's going to start kind of slow because we want to build up to this. One of the comic book series I've used as a template is um the Venom Run by Donny Cates. And mm. how it builds up to Null, the symbiote god. So I'm like, yeah. So it's kind of the trajectory I want to take with Storm as we build up to Oblivion as the big bad. So, yeah. So that's so just to buttress your point, Derek, we are going to be taking this big. It's going to be big. It's going to be lofty ideas. We're going to be playing around with uh, fun the storytelling, the mediums, where even though Marvel books are PG-13, we're trying to see how much we can push it. There is, there is a sex scene in Storm 3 that 
we found a way to push it as much as Marvel can take it, you know, <laughs> yeah, and just different stuff like that, you know. So, yeah, we're doing our very best to make it as brutal, sexy, and as much as Marvel would allow us. And why telling this extremely mythological story about this woman that has always been worshipped as a goddess? And let's see what it means to be worshipped as a god. What does that mean? And so that's that's what we're going to be visiting this story. I absolutely love that take. And I love the comparison too, because that's something I, I struggle when I read Superman. Just I love how you brought up the comparisons there. Because when you have somebody that's on such a power level, it's you need to have villains or, or events that challenge them and even exceed their own power levels. And that's where you really see the draw. I, I absolutely love that take. Not that I, was, I wasn't already sold before, but I'm now I'm like completely like this is going to be, I really think it's going to stand out too just because of that fact because we've seen Storm over the years has really evolved and even now I think has probably one of the biggest profiles in comics being a part of the Avengers, being an Omega level mutant and just how she was really the catalyst for finishing the threat of Nimrod and Orcus and in, in, in the yeah. th books there like that is just to show like where she's at as a character and where you're planning on taking her i mean that it's it's an amazing take that like i say i'm i'm getting too amped up to try talking about because i'm like <laughs> now that i'm starting to process I'm like man this is gonna be an amazing series and for where we're gonna be starting to i know we we have a couple of titles released what can you tell us about the series that we're gonna be moving forward like the initial arc um the initial arc um the episode title for that is called Grand Opening. And it basically centers, yeah, there's a synopsis about the an explosion that happens in Oklahoma City and everything. But if you're going to like summarize everything, it's basically about the Storm Sanctuary. It's a new superhero base. And she's going to be doing the grand opening. And she's going to be making some announcements on what this place means to her. And, you know, you know, um, I don't want to make comparison and stuff, but, you know, when Krakoa was, you know, being announced to the world, you know, mm -hmm. there were statements that Xavier made, you know, you have gods now, you know, that's not what Storm is saying now. Storm is going to be saying some, a different type, dif making different types of statements. They, they are going to be more heroic than threatening or fearful words. They're going to be heroic statements, but they're going to be very big and bold statements. And she's going to be saying those statements in issue one. And that's what the grand opening is all about. And um, issue two is death by voodoo. And if you're going to, if you're going to be, if you're going to elevate a character, if you're going to show how powerful new threats will come, you have to show how this character deals with smaller threats. You know, how do you show Superman is actually really powerful? You show you show him with, you know, small cops where they fire a gun, a, a bullet into his eyes and it flattens. You're like, oh, wow. Before we now start showing the big things. So you have to play around with your hero too before you bring in the big villain. So Death by Voodoo, we see how our relationship with... Uh, magic and how there's a threat that also comes to our life and we see how she plays around with that in death by voodoo and um making guest appearance there is going to be dr voodoo okay all right uh, so and um in um issue three issue three is impending doom and um with the sound of it doom you know dr doom and um this is the episode where um she's going to be visiting the uncanny X-Men team by Gail Simone. Okay. The Wolverine team and other mm -hmm. stuff. Some stuff are going to happen that's going to lead her into the hands of Dr. Doom. So, mm. so yeah, so impending doom. So stuff like that. And then um issue four is um flame in the wind. Mm. That's the one that is a little cryptic. But basically, um, she's going to be in Latveria having a serious talk with Dr. Doom. And mm -hmm. if you've know the history between Storm yeah. and Doom, mm -hmm. yeah, the first one, 
the first time they had that talk ended badly. Mm -hmm. In the second one, in an uh, Ali Ewing's, one was in Chris Clement, second was in Ali Ewing, with Ali Ewing. You know, it didn't end so good. Yeah, this one, I think in the narration, I said it's going to be a night that Latveria would never forget. So yeah, this this is going to be like crazy stuff. Uh, this is going to be the most epic meet between Storm and Doom. And it's yeah, going wait. to start out as, you know, a very good sexy meal between two sexy people, but <laughs> you should expect gruesome things to happen. And in episode five, there's something that I've always said in myself, even though it's not canon, but it's always been something myself. I've only, you know, in DC, you say dark side is. Mm -hmm. In Marvel, I've always imagined it's oblivion waits. Because they say everything in 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 the universe, you know, creeps towards oblivion. You know, oblivion is just waiting for us all. Yeah. So I've always mm -hmm. said oblivion waits. So it's a line that I, I insert a little into issue two of Storm. And I'll be sprinkling it across the entire series. But the title of um issue five is Oblivion Waits No Longer. And it's going to tell us, so it's going to be the inciting incidents. It's going to, we're going to learn what brings Oblivion and Storm head to head. And that's the first five issues. It, it, or wherever you're watching or listening, if you're not excited right now for what, <laughs> is getting pitched i don't i don't know what to tell you like i am like blown away by what is coming here this is really gonna th this is gonna be an amazing series just from what you're talking about mm -hmm. and it all kicks off on october 2nd i mean wow. i'm just processing this for a second so yeah this is just mixing all these elements in i mean this is a, yeah this is a take on storm i don't think we've ever seen no yeah so um i can't say too much but um if you're also into collecting and stuff like that I would advise to get two copies because some stuff might have first appearance of stuff. Uh, um, in issue one, the last page has the last page has the first appearance of something. Okay, all right, that's good to know. Well, first I can, appearance of something. Well, while Ken processes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I do not want to cut you off. You keep going. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the first issue has the first appearance of something, mm -hmm. but that's something. Oddly enough. As I was inspired and looks similar to something we've seen in Chris Clement's run and the bold take it took on Storm. Issue two, I can say that one that was in the solid seats. It's no big deal. Um, Night Nurse as a new superhero hospital. Okay, so okay. We're going to see what that means and how it relates to the superhero space. And it's something that we should be revisiting often. And um, as the story moves on, there will be key events that take place. So, yeah, just in case, can grab an extra copy in case some epic stuff happens. And Storm 6, I haven't gotten the green lights yet because the thing is, I've been super excited about this project that... Tom Brewer had to tell me to stop writing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I you be sure I you say like why, 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 why? In the in the books they announced in From the Ashes, Storm was basically the last. Like what the they call from the Ashes era. Yeah, there is um Sentinels and all those stuff, but they are outside the from the Ashes era. Mm. They are still in this new X-Men relaunch thing. But in that little graphics that we got, Storm is the last book that was announced. The graphics we got in the Comic Con, if you can remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, it, was, it was at Wolverine and um uh I think Dazzler. I think it was like that was the last three at that time. Yeah. Yeah. So and Dazzler came out and Storm is still out. So we're basically the last. So and I was so excited about this comic about these stories that i wasn't sleeping i wasn't eating well i was just writing and writing and writing and writing that storm was basically getting a new script 
every bloody week. And it's like, dude, <laughs> you've written all the way to February 2025. And it was still what? I think it was still July, maybe the... X-Men 1, I didn't even hit the shelves yet. It's like, dude, stop writing, please. <laughs> like, <laughs> like just, just, just stop. Like, because you're like you're going to be messing with some continuity stuff. Some things might change, things might happen. You might use a character that a character might kill later. Like, dude, just stop. Yeah, just stop. So, mm-hmm. so what I'm doing now basically is just promoting the book and um as the artwork comes in, maybe I adjust a little dialogue, change a little things here and there and stuff like that. So that's what I've been doing, basically. I've been waiting for everybody else to catch up. <laughs> so <laughs> so, I'm, so I'm basically waiting for every other person that started earlier than I did to like catch up to March of next year. <laughs> so when they've written March next year, then I start blazing again. So that's how excited I've been about about this story. Now, even though I've been warned not to write and stuff, yeah, I've secretly been like... (laughs) (laughs) I've secretly been writing like big stuff, like, yeah, and then the Phoenix showed up. Oh, that's great. And the, and the planet I told you about, yeah, the planet shows up again too, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, you know, stuff. So, and now I'm bringing like mythological characters there. I want to see if I can bring Shongo in, like, yeah, bringing Shongo in. So let's see. Oh, so the ultimate crossover. Like that. Yeah, yeah. Like, great crossover. Um, yeah, I found out that Shongo is canon in Marvel Comics. So I was like, yeah, I'm bringing him in. That was perfect. <clears throat> excuse me uh, i was gonna say you you brought up uh like the art coming in and uh, lucas wernick is doing the art on this um uh right now i was curious because i've spoken with you and a ton so often or uh, a few times now and i i've mm-hmm. gotten kind of an insight into how your process is between the two of you because you collaborate so frequently uh i was really genuinely curious how it's different of your writing process now with Lucas versus what you would do with Dotan. Yeah. Um, when I got the call from Tom Brevoort, I didn't know who was going to illustrate the work. Mm-hmm. So I was I was worried. I was worried. Because um, as a writer, like, you kind of, okay, of all the writers in the, from the Ashes era and the X-Men, everything, everything, everything. If I'm being honest with myself, um, when it comes to um, achievements, I'm like the least qualified. I'm the youngest. I'm 30 years old. And when it comes to like years I've worked in the American industry, I'm also the youngest. So I was worried they might just pair me up with someone that is just not as skilled as Dotun is. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. And so I was like, ah, oh, man. So I, I was worried. And if you're not getting that art support, no matter how lofty your ideas are, they're going to come off very shallow and very small-minded thinking, you know? You can talk about ah oh, these laser eyes coming from here, 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 and oblivion slithers around cosmic space. You know, it's easy for oblivion to just look like a worm when another artist draws it. You know, instead mm-hmm. of looking like a giant world eating serpent. You know, so I, I I was genuinely worried and scared. So, but I was like, you know what, I'll do my own job. And I'll do it well. So I just kept writing, and the image I had in my head it was still Dotun's art, basically. Mm-hmm. So that's how I was writing and scripting it. So the first issue, I I wrote the script the way I would write it to Dotun, and then after writing it, I receive an email 
Tom Brevard sent the script to everybody in the ex office, all oh. the other editors and all wow. the other writers. So it's basically so that everybody can know what's happening in everybody's book. Mm-hmm. So I was like, wait, wait, oh fuck. <laughs> <laughs> You're telling me Gil Simone, <laughs> Jed McKay, Declan Shalvey are going to be reading my script. What what the fuck? Like <laughs> and, <laughs> and and I was the last person and I was the last person on board. So that means I had not seen a Gil Simone script. I had not seen a Declan Shalvey script. I had not seen anybody else's scripts. But they would see my scripts. Mm-hmm. And and I told you, like, I'm new to the comic book industry. I, I don't know how other guys write their scripts. Like, I don't know if I'm writing, like, a, an illiterate just saying badass, like, 50 times. Like, and then this <laughs> badass thing shoots this badass stuff and this badass <laughs> stuff. So I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> so, ah, oh, man, I was, I was, I was, like, really, like, I was, I was feeling really, so I was like, okay, okay, okay. So for the next issue... I was I was I started using more flowery words because it's like other people are going to start like reading this stuff. Right. So now I, I wasn't only writing for myself, for Tom, for the artists. I was also writing in case other editors and other writers were reading this because this is public. This is for public eyes now. So my scripts, my scripts are like for a twenty-page comic. My scripts can be like 75 pages. And the reason why they are 75 pages is because I like format them all cool style. You know, <laughs> I have like this black highlight for like page one. Doom. I put like cool images of, let's say I want to talk about Cyclops. I look for like the badass image, like Jim Lee drawing Cyclops, you know, <laughs> and I say Cyclops, you know, blah, blah, blah. I use flowery words, you know, everything looks really, really good. Like, you can print these scripts and sell them. That's how good they look. So that's how I started writing those scripts. Mm-hmm. Then later, I heard it was um, Lucas Warneck that was going to be on the book. And um, I'm a little familiar with Lucas Warneck, but indirectly. If you are someone that goes through Pinterest, which I do a lot, just to look for, you know, inspirations and stuff like that. Lucas Wernick does a lot of like fan art and design work and stuff like that. You would have come across his work. So, but I didn't still put two and two together. So, um, and at that time, um, Fall of the House of X was coming out and stuff. So I was like, okay, I was like, ah, oh, man, this guy is working with Jerry Dugan. So I was like, man, sorry for coming. Okay, Epis died. Yeah. So it was on Fall of the House of X. So I'm like, this guy's going to catch a whiff of my script and be like, get me another writer. This guy is nonsense. Like, I've worked with great writers like Karen Gillen and Jerry Dugan. I are giving me Murray. Wow, your daily. Who is this? You know? <laughs> so I was also worried it was going to like look down on me and stuff. So then later I found out that like um more than I English is a second language for me, but I think more so for him. So then I was like, ah, oh, okay. For someone that English is a second language, let me also try to adjust my script so that in case he's using a translator, they will translate better. Because I'm also mm-hmm. uh, I also have computer science background, so I can have a rough estimate of how a computer algorithm probably translates some of these words, you know. So I went back again to adjust some of my scripts so that they, if he's reading them in like I would just straight, it won't be too confusing with so many uh, figures of speech, euphemisms, and stuff like that. And if he's using a translator, the translator won't get all fucked up, you know, and stuff. Instead of um, write complete sentences, you know, rather than just short sentences that. You know, if English is the first language, you would understand what's being said. But writing full sentences rather than, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I can't think of a good example right now, but full clear sentences like you are speaking formal English. 
you know, not, mm -hmm. not too many slangs, not too many stuff. So that's why I, I did that just. And um, I was so happy when he tweeted and said, you know, of all the people he has worked with, my scripts were, is like the most fun to work on. I was like, yes, it worked. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was really happy. So I think I added a lot of images more than I would so that to express myself more because for me to English is also like sometimes I still see comments from like Tom Brevoort and I'm like, I wonder what it's saying. And I have to think about it for like hours to be able to decode it because there are cultural differences too. Mm -hmm. There are some things that you guys think are like simple words, but I still have to like wait and be like, okay, what does this mean? And I'm not like shy about them anymore. I used to feel embarrassed about like, man, these people are going to say, can't you speak good English? Why don't you understand the meaning of this? So, but I just ask anyway. So, yeah, so I had a lot of images just in case he also has that challenges with mine because I'm also like, I'm. it's not only like, I'm not only writing in a second language for him. I'm also writing with the Nigerian flavor. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so mm -hmm. I had images just to make things much, much easy. So, and I think that has been, that has made the communication really, really fluid. Like right now, we're getting thumbnails and images and I'm like, wow. Like, it's like this guy is in my head because he's taking it to a whole level. And it's, it's it's been really, really nice seeing his interpretations and stuff. And his design work has been phenomenal. You know, I'm going to brag a little. Fall of the House of X compared to this is, the gap is just too much. Lucas Warnick is putting like way more into this. Mm -hmm. Like the mm -hmm. book is pretty, is spending like a lot, like days on pages just to get them to look good and stunning. Like, you know, the way you see his design work for when he's doing like all those Elfire Gala dresses and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that gets in that kind of amount of work on panels. That's kind of what he's doing on, this is a gorgeous book. And the characters dress like supermodels. Mm. So you, you, you're going to love this. So what I've been looking forward to, it hasn't gotten there yet. What I've been looking forward to is how Lucas Warnick is going to draw Oblivion. Oh, I can only imagine. Yeah. Like it's it's going to be mind-blowing. I would say we, we, we kind of alluded to a little bit about Hollywood, and obviously the X-Men are coming back into the MCU. So you being someone that really has an understanding of Storm, who would you cast in the new version of the X-Men for the MCU? Um, I think I, I got this question through Marvel, like some of the interviews they got us. And I really? gave an answer and Marvel cut it out because they were I think they were upset. <laughs> I, I, I said Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> <laughs> just Tropic Thunder Robert Downey Jr. dressed as Storm. Yeah, like just give give me more the rose, man. <laughs> <laughs> um ah. Uh, Oh my. I don't have any preferences. Sometimes when I see when I see people that look like Storm, they're usually like models. Mm. Not really actresses, you know. So it's it's always very weird to cast Storm. I always I think I always prefer her in cartoons. I watch cartoons mostly too. Like things like Blue Eye Samurai anime and stuff. That's why I kind of liked X-Men 97. Like mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm looking forward to the movies, but I hope I hope we get more cartoons of Storm. That's my that's my goal. That's my dream. Yeah, same. She was excellent. She was a real a real highlight of X Men '97. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, you alluded to it earlier. Um, that you had to kind of knock it off, but you know how I feel about Iron Man as well. So, I mean, <laughs> even though you had to not have him in every issue, she is an Avenger now, and they do cross over. Are we going to at least get a glimpse? Just a just a little hint of Iron Man, at least maybe popping around. Um, I think, I think Iron Man has a new armor in his new run. Mm -hmm. mm. So far, in the so far in the Avengers previews, I've not seen that new armor. Right, but it's the new armor, and Storm One comes out before Iron Man One, 
and it's the new armor that we draw. So yeah, he, Iron Man shows up for a page in his new armor. Fantastic. Nice. So so I'm happy I'm able to I'm happy the new armor shows up in our book even before the main Iron Man. So yeah, that's exciting. Yeah. Well, I'd say before we let you go, if anybody is not sold on October 2nd by now, what is the final pitch? What is the final selling point? Why should everybody be running down to the comic shops on October 2nd and picking up multiple copies of Storm Number One? Yeah, like I've said before, um, you you remember um Greg Capullo and Scott Snyder's Batman. Mm -hmm. uh, we remember Tom King and um, Tom King's uh, Mr. Miracle and Mitch Gerald's Mr. Miracle. Um, you remember Al Ewing's um, Immortal Hulk. Um, you know Ryan Stegman and Donny Cates' Venom. You're about to have another fantastic run by Murawa Adelia and Lucas Warneck. So don't miss it. Absolutely. I, I can't say it any better because honestly, from what you've told us in this interview, I am like so excited. I, like I was already amped up to read this before, but now it's like, this is really going to be one of those books that stands out. And I love the take that you have on it. And for Storm right now, Marvel's Mightiest Mutant to be presented in this format. I'm all in like this is really going to be one that I think is going to jump out at everybody about this. How about you, Derek? Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, Storm has never been one of my favorite characters, but I've been the, the fact that you were going to be writing her already made me want to pick this book up. Now it's it, after these descriptions, it might be my most anticipated going into October. So I, I'm so excited. Everybody make sure you go and pick it up. And uh, I, I, I'm speechless. I, I'm, I can't wait to see what you do with this book. Absolutely. Thank you very much. <laughs> And when the book and after the first arc wraps up, we definitely have to have you come back on and recap what we, what's been going down. So if you're interested, we're definitely down to talk about that again. I'm definitely interested. Absolutely. Like we say, everybody in the liner notes, you can find out how to get a hold of Mirawa and seriously do a favor too and pick up O Kogan. You want to pick this book up. You want to really push this because the story needs to be finished. It's an amazing read. And also go check out I am Iron Man too. It's phenomenal stuff. We're not just saying it. We just absolutely mean this. Thank you again to Miroa for coming on the show. And on behalf of Derek and myself, we'll end it like we always do on Turn a Page. When you have great issues in your hands, such as Okogun, Brutalizer of Gods, and Storm, and you see somebody struggling in the shop to find something, hand yours off to them. Tell them Turn a Page. We'll see you next time.